Welcome to everyone who's joined us for this Skillshare. We are really lucky to have Dr. Laura Lee facilitate the session for us on participatory research with children and youth. Thank you so much for doing this. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Well, it's a pleasure to meet with you all this. Well, for me, it's early morning. I can start by telling you a little bit about me. I am a an associate with Protechnon. I also teach at the universities here. I spent about six of the last 13 years in East Africa, based a little bit in Tanzania and then in Kenya and working a lot in Rwanda as well, and a bit more globally in Asia and South America as well. But uh, my passion really is participatory work with communities and especially with children and youth. So that's why I'm really excited to talk on this subject today. Could we introduce ourselves and our affiliation and what interests you about participatory research? I'm Kirsten, and I'm also with ProTechnon. I've been doing participatory research with children and youth, but I think it what we call participatory research is often um, child-friendly research. And I think it's actually quite difficult to implement real participatory research with children and youth, but I would like to have a better idea of how to do that well. So, Laura, I'm excited. Thank you. I'm uh, Alphonse. I work as an independent consultant in child protection and youth work in Kenya. I also have some experience of work in uh, Tanzania, in Moshi and Arusha, where I worked with the uh, street children and youth. Wonderful. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Natalie DeSole. I am a program evaluator, so not a researcher as much, but mm -hmm. I um, have a an independent consultant slash have my own company called Rooted Growth, and I use participatory methods um, to engage stakeholders. I have two uh, child protection projects in the state of Colorado right now, and I'm really excited to learn more about how you engage children and youth with these um, activities. Great. My name is Hannah Asfour, and I work for a company called Q Perspective. We're based in Jordan. And we have an office in Lebanon. I'm leading the research in M&E work. Uh, most of the work I focus is on is on the humanitarian sector and sustainable development. So uh, yeah, m much of the evaluations I've done also um, focuses on participatory uh, approaches. So I'd like to strengthen my uh, skills. So I'm interested in learning more. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much for all of your, your introductions and sharing your experiences and sort of where you're at now. And um, that, that helps me position myself because I realize there's a lot of skills on this call as well and within our network. I think participatory uh, research with children and youth in the child protection field is so significant. And um, I'm going to talk a bit about that, how it relates to rights uh, in the introduction. So there might be um, a chance for follow up. And I, I realize there's so many skills in the network that this is really just a conversation starter. So today I did want to focus a little bit on children's participation, what that means, participatory research and then what it looks like to be researching with children and youth, which is also different from, from participatory research. Then just talking about a way of approaching our work. Participatory approaches are not only a set of methods, but it is a way of approaching our work. It's an approach, but it's also a way of thinking and doing and acting and um, takes a lot of skill, as you all know. And then I'll talk a little bit about some specific applications and methods. And Kirsten, I I thought it was really interesting how you said, I'm curious to talk more about what real participatory work means. And I think that's where we'll, we'll look at how there is a real scale of, of participation in programs. Certainly, you know, the most participatory would be a child or youth led process, but that's not always the most appropriate or feasible. And so we're looking at kind of the different appropriate ways to be engaging children and youth in different program components, in different processes, and then in, in research. So I'm all for child and youth led research. I'm just also, also practical. And it's nice to see the, the range and the scope. Just a little background on children's participation from a rights-based perspective. Of course, basic needs and protecting children's physical and emotional and social and spiritual well-being is absolutely critical. But it's also important how we see how all of the rights affect children. So the CRC categories, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, have sometimes been split into participation, protection, and provision. Oh, here's another way to categorize the rights. Survival rights, protection rights 
development rights, where you have the education and influence, which allows children to develop successfully, and then participation rights, taking part in the wider society and having input into relevant decisions. These are all important. And yes, there are certain ones that if you looked at an individual case, you'd have to act on quicker or first, but we do see how they are all important. And so that's sort of what we're getting at here in this session is we're looking at a set of methods, but we also need to know behind it, how much do we believe in these? How are they important for our work? How are they important for how we perceive children and their capacities? And so these are what are delineated as the participation right in the CRC. Uh, so others can, can also sort of go into the category. There's some that straddle both or straddle a few categories. But, you know, we look at some of these really significant things to identity and to purpose and to being part of a family and community. And so participation really means being a part of a family, a community, a society, and then having a say in things that affect some, affect them, affect their own well-being. Uh, the right to speak their own language, that one's super critical in, in Canada where that was stripped from our, our first peoples. The right to practice their religion, get information they need, have ideas in what they think, say about things that affect them the right to know about their rights and responsibilities to learn and enjoy their own culture and how they relate to other things. Like if we were using participatory research when we're looking at a, a topic such as you know, neglect or mitigating abuse, then you have other rights that come in and have interplay with these participation rights. And you can see how they're all related and how it's so important to have children at the center. So in terms of participatory research, I'll just give a little background from some sources that I found really interesting. I've done a lot on participatory action research as, as well with children and youth, and I, I know that some of you have too. So we can see how, how there is major benefits and positive aspects uh, to these approaches and also challenges. What do you think of when you hear participatory research? Engagement. Mm -hmm. I confess that some of the words that come out first are not positive. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> One, <laughs> a lot of work, a lot of time, mm -hmm. and that's difficult when you're on a, a short timeline for the project. I think it's important, but those are sort of... <laughs> <laughs> it feels a bit like kind of managing a really big kid's birthday party for many hours. <laughs> So as a mom, that's tiring. <laughs> I love the analogy. Ownership and then concrete being the, the yeah. real concrete situation. Yeah, that's, that's great, actually. Grounded. I should add that when I've done participatory research, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. And definitely a highlight in my whole research <laughs> career here. <laughs> I like the um, perception of participatory research as a relational process. And here it says through which knowledge is produced collectively rather than by an individual on their own. And research really is harnessing knowledge. And action research is harnessing knowledge and doing something with it through the process, not just through the outcome. And Alphonse was getting at that perspective of grounded. It's bottom up. It's not top down. As we'll see, some participatory research can be top down and tokenistic, but, but true, as when we talk about real participatory research, should be based on this perspective of creating social change from the ground up. So whose knowledge are we trying to get? And generally, participatory research is trying to challenge this notion of Western knowledge as being superior. Participatory research doesn't only work cross-culturally, but it definitely does work cross-culturally a lot. It's really trying to get Indigenous, local, and cultural knowledge. From a child protection perspective, we're really trying to look at what are families, what are individuals, what are communities doing to care for the children? What forms of child protection do we see that can be built on? What qualities do children have that we can build on in any programming. What does this speak to for our research? And here you'll we'll end up seeing some social change or addressing social disparities through the process. When participatory research is done in, in other domains, there's usually a social justice issue at hand. And it really is an advocacy piece for some people and has that sort of knowledge translation component built right into it. I love the, the phrase of uh, co-creating, co-creative processes. So where you have sometimes adult allies working with children, working with youth who are working together to co-create something. So whether it's to develop 
develop a program, whether it's to think through what they want their outcomes of their participatory action research project to be. It's a co-creative process that's ongoing and Kirsten, it does take work <laughs> and it does take time and it is super valuable, but it, it is all of those, those things. And also when you're working with populations that are facing different challenges and marginalized groups, there's time restrictions from the children and youth perspectives as well. And so something that I've realized a lot in my participatory action research is that there's a real need to have this iterative process of communication, of navigation and openness as a team while you're going through, because there's certain pieces that the youth might be really relieved if you take over, or if they feel just more supported on. I, I was in this longitudinal pilot project, actually in Egypt and in Iraq, uh, doing a, we've been doing a arts-based participatory action research project. And we found that the monitoring and evaluation, the youth were completely capable of doing, but it was overwhelming. They didn't have much time. And they thought, you know, if the adult allies can support us in parts of this, then it gives us more time and energy to work on the participatory action research pieces and the projects that we actually want to do to create social change in our communities. So it's this interesting give and take of what is the best in each situation. I liked this quote. It's from a participatory research a handbook on, on health. Participatory research processes and those who take them on have a learning for change agenda. They want to make the system in which they are researching better. Change is the outcome, It's a social, and social learning is, is the mechanism. And the image of this knitting is that we're knitting our worlds together. People in this process might be coming from different perspectives, but we're knitting something together. And so it's bottom up, it's, it's participant focused, but everybody's input comes into the final product or into the process. And then when we think about what is our system, if we're looking at, uh, they want to make, we want to make the system better. I think participatory action research is really akin to the system's perspective, where we see an individual, our child, a youth, within the context of a family, within the context of a community, and uh, within the context of a broader societal framework. And so you really have uh, this need to be uh, seeing the whole person in the whole community. So what is our system? It might be child protection, it might be healthcare or education, it might be humanitarian systems. Often there's multiple systems at play. And so we have to also think, what does better mean? We wanna make the system better and we wanna be engaging children and youth to do that. And so that might be needs being met, that might be living in wholeness for these these children in, um, and youth, that might be children stopping abuse that might be engaging children in social and political spheres where they're actually initiating the whole process. So we could kind of meet at different at different points. Okay, so I want to just talk a little bit about applied and it's, and I, I know some of you are from an m and &E background and I've used participatory research at different phases in the program cycle. They're really, really fantastic at a baseline survey stage. Now, Unfortunately, in the programmatic field and where funding goes, there's rarely <laughs> funding allocated for that initial stage, but it's just so beneficial when that happens and when there, when children and youth can be engaged right from the outset before the program is even designed. And then there's the co-design and implementation of programs that can happen with children and youth. And then there's the monitoring and evaluation. And so any of these pieces can be done with child-friendly tools, and that is participatory approach but a really child-led um, approach through the whole process would look different. And this is one perspective of stakeholder engagement would be the, in the participation field, how, how we would could term it. But this is more a engaging community members in a participatory process through community assessment that's done on a cyclical scale, designing the project, collecting data, interpreting it, findings, going back to community assessment, redesigning your project. This is from, from a health model, but the steps apply in sort of keeping the community, whoever those stakeholders are at the center is really what's important to that. And so it's really in planning, it would be doing some sort of baseline assessment, program assessment with children involving them in des defining program objectives. Again, yes, this takes time, but doing it together is, um, is what leads to more meaningful programmatic opportunities, determining appropriate activities, and then developing your monitoring and impl implementation strategies. And again, that's not always all uh, children and youth doing those. That might be 
part components of those might be led by children and youth. And sometimes we strive for it all to be. These are some of the principles of participatory evaluation, and this applies to program, any stage of the program, I think, where it's participant focused and ownership, and ownership is a, you know, a key word that Alphonse did bring up earlier. And it really grounds us. Structures and processes include those who are most frequently powerless or voiceless, um, honors human contributions and cultural knowledge. And there's a real negotiation where participants work together, that knitting, to decide the approach. And then there's this learning component where throughout, in participatory research or participatory programming, there's an opportunity to be reflecting and learning throughout. In fact, I usually refer to monitoring and evaluation as MEL, uh, monitoring, evaluation, and learning, and sort of applying those learnings throughout our programs or throughout the participatory action research and making modifications where, where needed. And then, of course, having flexibility. This is super important. Having creative methodologies, providing options, and then matching the resources and skills of the participants, using as much as we can the resources from that uh, community, from that group, and then looking to the needs as well and how they can be supported. We can think of stakeholders as being the children and youth and those that are close to them and who affect their, their lives significantly. And um, engaging these people in the whole process is really important in ownership, in ensuring voices are heard, enhancing credibility, harnessing local knowledge, transparency, and anticipating barriers and mitigating those along the way. Generally, stakeholders are those who have an interest and it's funny that we overlook the, the children in this process often in um, a child protection situation. And I think that is changing. But we need to be identifying all the people who are important in a setting and then determining the degree of involvement each stakeholder will have. And as we said, that's not always full participation for everyone, but what would be appropriate in the situation? And what is children's role in that a particular situation, what is the role of youth, and then determining the roles for each stakeholder in the planning process and engaging them in a meaningful way. Meaningful is, is the key here <laughs> because there is some propensity to, as I say, to not be engaging meaningfully, especially with children and youth. I won't go through this in too much detail, but just to say that basically in every child protection project that we're working with, children and youth are primary stakeholders. And it's really interesting that, that sometimes they're not engaged uh, meaningfully in the process, whether that's working together with them, using their skills and however we can, and then also looking to their, their best interests in terms of um, taking some of the tasks away from them if, if time is a concern. Then you also have secondary stakeholders and key stakeholders. And I think I bring it up later, but uh, one of the really great ways to, to engage stakeholders from the start is to form advisory committees. And having a child-led or youth-led advisory committee can be really effective in engaging them from the start of either an evaluation process or a program process and having and, and truly having them co-design and co-implement um, processes is, is, is something that's really interesting, whether you meet together once a week or just cons work together on each step of the process. Um, and then sometimes you can have those as community advisory committees where there's youth representatives, but there's also other key people, whether it's parents and guardians, teachers, other NGOs, some local government people. So that can be a really practical way to, to engage people through the process. And this is just to, to say that there are also different roles that they can have, including children and youth. Where do children fit into this? There's core, there's people who are involved, there's people who are supportive of the process, and there's periphery. And you could see how, how some of the key stakeholders would be more on the outside. But really, children and youth are at that center. And, um, and that's what we need to be considering when we're engaging in these processes, especially in the child protection field. What is unique about children compared to other groups? I think a lot of the differences between children and other groups also exist within groups. Mm -hmm. So I was going to say that you'll have very different levels of literacy and perhaps um, cognitive abilities, but you can also say the same within adult populations if they're not, you know, really educated populations. So in my work, I kind of kept in mind what those differences were, but also had to remember that it's similar with adults. So, mm, for yeah. Sure. What are some of the strengths that are unique to children? Children can, can be more playful. Mm-hmm. 
more more accepting to to accept you can use more innovative tools with them or mm -hmm. they can be more honest or see the world in a less formulaic way creative yeah yeah some of the strengths that that jump out to me are like sarah said playful and fun that curiosity uh, creativity. I think children have a lot of humor. One of the things that that I find really incredible about children is, even, and especially children at adversity, is is their innate resilience, and um, really taking a strength based approach. We think, how can we draw on children's unique qualities in research? And you know, when we look at how children are depicted by you know large NGOs and et cetera, and especially funders and people who are fundraising, of course, try to draw on the vulnerability aspects of children. And we have to see the whole child. Children have to have strong vulnerabilities, and a lot of the children we all work with do. But we they also have a lot of strengths, and these are strengths that we can bring into processes. And this is where we have to be wise in you know how much do we draw children in 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 different situations. But there is so much we can draw on from a strength based approach. Has anyone seen this before? Yes. Yes. So this is, there's a general ladder of participation and this is the child focused one. So at the bottom you have manipulation, decoration, and participation for show. Those are not participation. <laughs> and then moving up you have young people are assigned tasks and informed how and why they'll be involved in a project. Adults make decisions, young people are informed and consulted. Adults uh, take initiative and there's joint decisions, and then you have young people's initiative and leadership and decisions made in, in partnership with adults, and those are the highest levels of participation. So the first three rungs are not participation. The second set, they kind of represent situations where young people are more aware about their role and why they're involved and have some say in the processes. There are situations where these are absolutely the most appropriate way to go about, but where they're actually listened to. <laughs> you know, where it's collaborative decision making, where young people are fully informed, where their opinions matter and are taken into consideration, and where they have some say in how it's gonna go about. And then the top two are, are more youth-led, and um, where youth are in, and children are in a position to initiate direct a program. Adults are involved in a supportive way or a collaborative way. I find the image of the latter itself to be somewhat problematic, being it, that it's a hierarchical approach. And um, we have to recognize that the top rung is not always the ideal. It is something to strive for if it's possible, but we, we can work with other rungs of participation as well. And then another really interesting way to approach this is thinking of it as pockets of participation. There's a, an article about this that I can can share with you if you're interested. It's a really useful way to think of, of programming where there could be clashing interests with power relations. Uh, sometimes children and youth logistically can't be part of the program design. That's often the case, like even for, say, my doctoral research in Kenya, working with youth who were doing sexual health with youth who were heads of households in Nakuru County. The institutions for funding programs and for funding academic research tend to be that you have to have a full proposal going in. And so how do we work with these challenges where the systems are against full participatory processes, unless it's a grassroots-led initiative that sort of gains momentum and gets funding later. It's really hard to actually do that. So one useful way to look at it is pockets of participation and where can we have youth or children be part, can be in total control over certain parts of the process. And so one way to do that is you go in with your proposal and your methods, and then you refine those with the community, with the children. And then there's parts of that that they do take on fully. So here, uh, Frank says, given that total participation is in all probability a false goal, it may be that the way forward is to develop participative ownership of specific parts of the research process so that participants become stakeholders rather than owners of the research. And so looking at a way of approaching our work, to think of a project that you're involved with, it might already be participatory. Where do you see it on that ladder and how would a participatory approach enhance the work? Would it be full participation? Would you be doing pockets and what challenges might arise? I was involved in uh, evaluating a program that focused on participatory approaches to develop community projects. And uh, one thing I noticed was that 
like one of the problems that came out was that, that sometimes the what the community chose they thought was a priority that would help their community in terms of development and economic development turned out to be not a priority and in the long run it turned it didn't really benefit compared to other ideas that came about so that was something interesting sometimes participatory research or participatory approaches in development they need to be planned well to have an impact absolutely that's a great point project that you and i will be working on around adolescent sexual reproductive health we've been planning for the youth to develop the educational content but i think they need to do it within parameters that are informed by sexual health expertise knowledge so that their advice to their peers is informed by our research we have to really be careful with what kind of behaviors and we're promoting through their through their narrative we want them to develop content that will be engaging for them and their peers and relevant but we also want it to be informed by health knowledge. Yeah, and this is an interesting one because this is an example where we can do a really innovative co-creative process where it's so well, maybe we can I'm just sharing this with the group to 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 show how you can mitigate these challenges through actually just naming what you're doing. We are going to do some capacity building workshops with the youth and then following that we're going to co-create the content. Something like that where you're they're fully engaged in all steps but they're supported in reaching an outcome that'll be most beneficial for them. It's not tokenistic because it's capacity building and they're involved through the process. It is challenging to think how can we have this as youth led as possible while developing content and or whether it's a, a different type of process that you're working with where you're concerned that what might come out isn't the most beneficial if they're fully leading on it. Maybe maybe I say something on that because yeah, I, I, th- I think that's where we have the biggest challenge because um, the context already has been defined. The, the youth have to participate within a defined context. And the other question would be whether they were really involved in terms of co-creating mm-hmm. uh, the context upon which they have to participate, you know, uh, in develop the, the content that they have to work with. Because otherwise, participation normally ends up being a hoped for objectives where we always never reach in our pro- professional practice because mm-hmm. in a good number of occasions, maybe due to cultural issues, sometimes if you look at it from our, from our cultural practice, mostly in Africa, but uh, maybe uh, from the professional on, or, or uh, other perspectives would come in, and then the children's point of view actually will be um, sharpened to to fit into mm. a certain context. And where, whether that is still uh, a call participation is where I actually get stuck a little bit. That's a great point, Alphonse, is where, where you're looking at, at different life experiences and worldviews mm. and where you want to make sure that there isn't manipulation in, in perspectives. That's a, a great, it is a huge challenge. How can the process be the most bottom-up possible? Yeah, how do we go about that where we ensure that their priorities, that their views are, are brought forward and acknowledging that, yes, medical research and knowledge is out there and will protect them, but how does that, because this is a sexual health initiative, how can that be applied most effectively and seen within the the worldview, how can we also take the local knowledge and ways of communicating and seeing the issues and seeing community life and and apply? I, I was doing youth needs assessment uh, using uh, appreciative inquiry method, looking at it from the strength based. Once we had a uh, uh, prioritized on needs, uh, where we had uh, uh, we had. Uh, and nurturing of talents, access access to information and communication, educational support, small scale business support, life skill development, and vocational skills training. And when I used pairwise ranking uh, to rank uh, the most support that the the, the youth would require, and uh, they went on the vocational skills training. And these were young people of ages between uh, um, 18 and uh, 25 or so years. 
and even them when they when they did the pairwise right ranking and came out with the vocational skills training mm. they were saying no it should be educational support and i asked them yeah but though you are the the ones who have ranked it and then he said okay do you want to now change it to education or what and they said oh yeah i think probably we just leave it with the, with the vocational skills training and uh, okay i would have seen it myself as a professional practitioner that it should have been more or less of education rather than vocational skills training so it's very difficult really to see it from the eyes of uh, mm -hmm especially the youth or, or children, because we always have our own professional and practice baggage along with us, and maybe <laughs> what we experience elsewhere, you know, <laughs> it worked. It worked somewhere. I think it will work for them as well. Then. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, and I like that you phrase it as baggage, because, yeah, we have educational and experienced backgrounds that can prove very beneficial, and at times, they're baggage. They don't allow us to see from the actual perspectives of the people who are, we're engaging with. Here's with some of the participatory methods that I've used in research and in monitoring and evaluation. There are a suite of tools that I, I do employ. Um, some of these are more visual and some of them are more performative, which would be more arts-based. Visual, arts-based tools can be visual or performative. Performative would be more like drama-based tools, they work so well with youth in, very, in many, many places. This one where you see on the side with two young women there, that's a tool to get, to get youth engaged and thinking where you have, it's called follow the hand, the face has to follow the partner's hand. And it gets into discussing, it's a very simple activity, but it gets into discussing whatever comes to mind for the youth, which is often power relations and how you can, how these are at play, either in the research process you're dealing with or in the topics or in the community. They can be a real springboard. All these tools can be a real springboard to, to more exploration. And so sometimes, even if you're doing a focus group discussion, I love to start them with a participatory activity, whether it's a drawing activity. Here you have a community mapping. Uh, community maps can be used for so many things that you can have them draw their map, how they see it, and then you can say, where do you go to for help? They mark that in a color. Where do you go to, um, which areas are dangerous for children? Where do you get resources? And then you can also map out sort of where school is. You can also do a future map. How do you see your, your community in the future? Some of these other tools here I've, <laughs> I've designed myself in the bottom right is a uh, social mapping where you have I had who, who are all the people in your life who help you or authorities in your life. So we had a grandmother was the pot there, the pastor or the church, uh, teachers, health workers. Then we chose an issue and I say, and you say, who is helpful in this situation and who causes harm in this situation? And you have the youth sort of move the cards around and talk through and change what their, their peer might say and to say what is happening in this situation. Play-based tools are fantastic with children and youth and even adults <laughs> and actually can be used in monitoring and evaluation too. You can have state, you can have different settings in the room. Go to this wall by jumping if you feel you ask a question and you could have on the walls different different settings, agree, disagree, neutral. That's a very physical way. A lot of cultures engage very physically with their environment or through movement. And a lot are oral traditions. And so storytelling, drama work really, really well. For planning purposes, I love doing some sort of daily schedule, having them make a schedule or a daily activity profile. This is an example where youth drew on different pieces of paper all the tasks that they do during the day. I think this one was going to market and uh, then take a bean for each hour in their day. And once you have all the tasks out, they put a bean on different pieces of paper and that will show how many hours, each bean is one hour, how many hours they spend on that, on that activity on a, a general, on an average day. And then you can add those up. Here I did, I also split it in gender. So I think red was women and, and, um, and the white ones were young men. You can add those up. The tree of life, I'm sure you've used the tree before in many different situations. It can be used in so many different ways. It can be used as a solutions tree. It can be used as sometimes a problem tree. It can be used as, as a way to do program planning, looking at what are the roots, what are our 
core principles, uh, what activities are we going to use, and what do we hope the outcomes to be can be the, the tree that can be the leaves. In this case, it was used to analyze the challenges to sexual health in a community. And the youth did an incredible analysis because the roots were actually the causes of their challenges. So if you want to take a systems approach, then we have to actually be working with those roots. And how can we do that on a programmatic level it can be very difficult. But it's really interesting seeing the youth's ideas actually having their recommendations come forward out of these types of activities. I'll just touch on a few more. We've already talked about the community map. This is a great one for monitoring and evaluation doing sort of a, a river as a most significant change and um, having the each year of the program or each year of youth's um, experience in a camp and what, what activities uh, were impactful to them and having them tell stories about that along the way. That can be a really interesting evaluative tool or even a reflective tool after the journey of a workshop you've done together or you could transfer it to many different uh, situations. And just the last couple here, uh, looking at the benefits of these types of tools being transformative in and of themselves, being suitable to different cultural contexts, having transformative capacities, and being able to explore difficult or sensitive topics as well. They can be used in evaluation, they can be used in research, they can be used in program planning, and they can also be used for therapeutic purposes. Uh, this ribbon of life was something I learned from a colleague in Rwanda who does incredible work with, with young people. And youth were allowed to construct their, their life timeline through just gathering different pieces of fabric, different colors to represent. And this is their ribbon of life. They could sew on buttons for to represent people, different ways you can assess so, things like social support. So this is just a, uh, a really brief overview of some tools. Certainly I could point you to some resources and I'm sure you'd have some really interesting resources to share as well and tools that have worked for you. But obviously this was just an introduction session and we can't cover everything in one, in one hour. I just want to invite you to uh, keep reflecting on this, keep in contact about what might be how we could continue the conversations. I just want to thank you all for uh, engaging in this today. And it's been a pleasure getting to know a little bit about your work as well. Thank you very much for sharing. This was great. <laughs> thank you, Laura. Yeah, so many great ideas. Well, thank you so much, Laura, again, for leading us in this session. It was really, it was good. It was a nice first um, Skillshare and looking at this topic and I really hope that we'll be able to continue this theme. So thank you so much for everything. Oh.